Hello and welcome to a new video. In the 2014 Kickstarter for Scorn, the developers saw fit to compare their upcoming title to three others. The first of the games was the Metroid Prime series, the second was Dark Souls, but the third might have been a little bit surprising to people given the gruesome, grisly, Gagirian nature of Scorn and that was Journey. However, these two games might be more in similar with each other than Scorn with Metroid Prime or Dark Souls. Both games are about a lone protagonist shuffling through a dead and desolate world of a once prosperous or at least mighty civilization. With just about every sapient creature dead or gone, what's left is to shift through the machinations of the autonomous structures that were left behind. The protagonist isn't there to save the world or rebuild it, but instead to go from point A to point B in order to either ascend beyond the world or at least move to a different location, leaving everything behind. And indeed, from point A to point B because what's a criticism of Scorn and not Journey is the relentless linearity of the title. In both games, there's no location that exists that the player isn't inevitably going to have to go to. In fact, arguably, Journey has more optional locations to find yourself in, even if it does mean just veering to the left or the right a little bit more than you would if you were just going straight. Both games live and die by their art style, with Journey having its stunning, cartoony, simplistic, vivid, rather saturated desert locations and tombs, and Scorn having its dark, grisly, Gigerian, and Beksinskian architecture full of hostile imagery. They also both have fantastic soundtracks, a score that I find myself listening to on YouTube quite frequently. But overall, I think one of the greatest similarities is the fact that both games come off as titles that the developers knew there wouldn't be another of. Journey is a one-off title, there's not going to be any sequels, spin-offs, or anything like that. Scorn also wants to be a one-off title, but it shouldn't be. It should definitely have some expansions. One similarity between both games is how short they are. Journey you can beat in an hour and a half even when taking the scenic route, and Scorn, even though the developers say the game is six to eight hours long, it's more five to seven. However, despite Journey being objectively the shorter game, it still feels like the longer game, the more complete game, and that's largely due to its story and all the narrative beats. And so today, I'd like to go over the general plot and journey of both games and try to see why it seems like this shorter title feels longer than the objectively longer title. Journey begins by setting up the environment that the character will find himself in. The character I might as well call Journey Guy, like how I call the protagonist of Scorn, Scorn Guy. It is a vast desert, underneath an immensely hostile sun with the most protruding architectures being these gravestones littered among the sand. We see a single sprite flying in the sky well over the tombstones. This is what will eventually be our character, and indeed, our character emerges not too long later. He is a funny humanoid figure with no real face except for two glowing eyes, underneath a red and yellow cloak. The game tutorializes the most basic stuff like camera and movement and jumping before we get to see what we're looking for. You can see here that the gamer would be immediately drawn to the hill, it being the only thing with any noticeable structures on it, whereas the rest of the scenery is just simplistic sand. 
And when you climb the hill, emerging over the horizon is the destiny for the journey. The camera will begin to zoom in, and you will be greeted by the sight of a massive towering mountain with a peculiar shining gap in between it. That mountain is the destiny, and it looms over almost every part of the game. It doesn't take much to incentivize the gamer, just tell him where he needs to go and he'll try to get there. Scorn, meanwhile, starts out with a cutscene showcasing what we will later discover to be the Parasite, the game's main antagonist. The camera zooms in on his face as he seems to be asleep, twitching in his dreams, before he suddenly wakes up. He is fractured and deformed due to some free haphazard accident that we'll play through immediately after this. However, as of now, the cutscene then transitions to a first-person view, where he breaks out of these tendrils on the ground, and then we get interlaced clips of him crawling on his stomach within the facility and in the outside world. He seems to put much stock on this larger structure there, almost as if it's the game's mountain. However, that's not the case. The game's mountain isn't even visible for most of the game. This is the structure that is supposed to have a means of getting to the mountain. What's interesting is that in the art book, they talk about the Nexus, which is the portal at the end of Scorn. In the exact same pages, they talk about the very beginning structures of the game, almost to imply that originally the Nexus was supposed to be something visual that the player could see and be drawn to. As said before, the initial desert part in Journey is filled with tombstones, and indeed, in a temple area not too far away from there, that is absolutely confirmed by some wall art, almost as if this is a resting place of little Journey guys like our own, ones who didn't quite make it. In the actual start of the game, that being when you take control of the character you're going to play as for the majority of it, you're born, drop down, and land amongst a bunch of bodies. Given both the opening cutscene and the very ending cutscene during the credits, it's implied that this is a cyclical sort of thing. Some spirit goes from the mountain to the start of the journey, and then is supposed to make it over to the end. We don't know why that happens. It could be some kind of penitence for the destruction these characters have caused to the environments and themselves, or it could just be a brute fact way the world works. I'd argue this is somewhat similar to how Scorn operates. Exact same copies of the same character are born out of this massive wall and are supposed to make some arduous journey over to Paulus in order to complete the Ascension ritual. And similar to Journey, not everyone's a winner. Some die on impact at the fall, and others just don't make it. The bodies of multitude of skill-issue adult fucks litter the landscape, not even given the dignity of a tombstone in Scorn's grim, depressing world. However, unlike the journey that Journey Guy takes, the journey for Scorn Guy has an unintentional variable, the fucking parasite. It's very clear that this thing is not supposed to exist. It was born out of an accident that the prologue character caused and endured. And of course, if you've played Scorn or watched a Let's Play, you'd know that the Parasite is what ultimately robs Scorn Guy of the end of his journey. Also different between both games is that Journey almost implies that the cycle resets, everything goes back to square one. Meanwhile, Scorn makes it very clear that time has passed between the prologue and the main game. 
Meaning, if anyone comes out of that wall after Scorn Guy, he's going to be even more up shit creek without a paddle. In this part of Journey, you're introduced to the first and pretty much only real mechanic in the game, jumping and calling out to these little scarf creatures. How long you can jump for is based on how long your scarf is, and you can increase the length of your scarf and thus jump longer by finding optional glowing sigils throughout the journey. To call Journey a walking simulator would be a fair assessment, even if there is jumping in the game. Mechanically, it's so simple that it's actually impossible to lose. There quite literally are no losing conditions. No point where the game says, You fucked up too much, go back to this point and try again. Even when the game introduces hostile entities, the only thing they do is decrease the length of your scarf when they hit you. They never kill you. In fact, I've even tested it out. Apparently, once they deplete the full length of your scarf, they quite literally fuck off. And there's actually a little bit of a story integration with this, because when we see one for the first time, it attacks the scarf things. Scorn, on the other hand, is also often referred to as a walking simulator. You're unable to jump or perform any fancy moves, but mechanically it's more complex. There is, for example, combat in the game. Combat, where there's a losing condition of if you lose too much health, you have to start from a previous uh, checkpoint in the game. There's Four different weapons in the game, though it might be more accurate to say just three, the piston, the pistol, and the shotgun, since a grenade launcher is something you use once against a single boss at the very end of the game. Every so often, you'll come across an item that you'll need in order to progress. This comes in the form of basically fuses in one of the areas and then vials of homunculi juice at the very end. The only other item in the game you have is the healing coral, which holds the health items and ammunition, and the key you use to open up doors and have to upgrade occasionally along the way. Adding to the challenge of Scorn are puzzles that you'll need to solve. They usually stop the action, require you to find the solution, and then that allows you to progress further into the world of Scorn. The very next thing you'd find in Journey is this amusing area. It actually serves as a kind of chapter select screen, and also has a little area that if you collect all of the sigils, you're able to immediately unlock the white and gold robe Journey guy, which is basically your character but he has the full length of scarf and therefore the full jumping ability right off the bat. Scorn also has a chapter select area. It's just a screen and you select the different acts without even any real indication of where you're going to be dropped down in. The real start of the game comes when you activate these little pillars and then sit down in that beam of light. You're greeted by a cutscene of a taller, gold and white robed figure with the mountain in the distance. The cutscene reaffirms that yes, the mountain is the goal, that's where you're going to want to go, and then transitions into another cutscene showing a simplistic, primitive art style that tells a story of the humble beginnings, the rise, and the eventual fall of the journey creatures. It's a simple but effective method of conveying the game's story and history, one that Matthew Matosis described as, even if you took someone from one of those uncontacted tribes and had them play this game, they too would be able to completely understand it. We see there's a degree of interconnectedness between the journey creatures, their world, and the quote-unquote technology that they have. The doors then open and you're allowed to truly begin your journey. 
The interconnectivity between Journeyman, Journey Machine, and Journey World is not that dissimilar from the interconnectedness between Scorn Man, Scorn Machine, and Scorn World. Journey is just less gruesome about it. With Scorn, unfortunately, we don't really get much of a sense of the history of the world, how the species rose up and developed technologically, and how it all went to shit. There's like two murals in Paulus that are the full extent of Scorn's history that we're supposed to glean every bit of information from, and I'm of the view these are either made up, as in, do design a mural that seems kind of significant because we can't think of anything else, just do something, or too much was cut from what was supposed to be part two, that nothing could be expanded upon in regards to what that mural was showing. In the 2020 trailer, there's rooms like that one with the giant head statues that look to be expansions into the world of Scorn and possibly a chance to get an idea of the history, but unfortunately so much was cut and narratively Scorn doesn't use any cutscenes or text or dialogue throughout the game that we just don't know how things went. I'm not saying that Scorn should have spoon-fed us cutscenes, but having more murals showing off more of the world, because there's more of Paulus and other areas showcasing more of the history of the world, would have helped immensely, even if some of it is still up to player interpretation. The fact that the majority of the game takes place in the Crater, which is a huge lore hole that answers only a single question as to where the creatures came from, might be one of the reasons why Journey felt longer despite being shorter. It was jam-packed with far more relevant material to the game's history. Knowing the mechanics of Journey, simple as they are, you're presented with your first challenge. Here's what should be a bridge from point A to point B, but so much of the actual bridge part is missing, leaving only a small few platforms situated on tall pillars. In order to repair the bridge, so to say, you need to find some of these carpet creatures waving outside of the derelict bodies of these strange stone entities, ones that, even if they lay dormant, seem somewhat hostile compared to the rest of the environment. A flurry of smaller carpet creatures emerge and band together to form a bridge to allow you to get from point A to point B, showing kind of benevolent relationship between Journey Guy and these creatures. The scope and scale of these dead constructs are quite massive compared to her own character, and they almost resemble a sort of sea creature, a very primitive, primordial sea creature at that, as opposed to anything that should actually be up in the air. Perhaps this desert was once more oceanic. We'll actually see more on later in the game stuff that seems like it should be oceanic or sea-like, but clearly not in any body of water. It's almost a recurring visual motif with this game. There are some carpet creatures stuck in these single segments. They don't contribute to the construction of the bridge and are completely optional, thus becoming a case of what TV tropes likes to call uh, video game carrying potential. Basically, are you willing to go out of your way to do something nice for someone, even if it might not have a reward? There's a couple moments like that in Journey, and I think it's a fun little addition. Scorn doesn't necessarily have something like that unless you count letting the creatures waddle over into a despawn zone instead of fighting them, as an example. Eventually, the bridge is finished and you're able to ride up your work into the next section of the game. Scorn has something somewhat similar in the sense that you're trying to move these spherical cages 
from one point to another in order to use them to get to the next area. Rather than standing near a derelict creature and doing a thing, you instead need to solve some puzzles in order to unlock the next part of this general room in order to then move the spheres further and further around. The end result being they're in a position where you can go in one and then it goes around a corner and congratulations, you're in the next area. There isn't any optional video game carrying potential beyond the aforementioned let the creatures waddle into a despawn zone, but there is actually an option to grab the pistol in this area or not. Like I said, unlike Journey, Scorn does have losing conditions and combat. Though Scorn doesn't really tutorialize how to use a pistol, me standing still, aiming, and the reticle becoming smaller to be more accurate is something you just kind of have to know about beforehand or accidentally discover. In that sense, it's kind of interesting to know that Journey has tutorialized effectively everything it needs to prior to the level select, while Scorn introduces new mechanics that you have to figure out along the way. And what new things Journey might introduce gameplay-wise down the line are stuff that's so obvious that anyone who might have played a video game before and knows if there's an enemy and a, like a circle of light where that enemy is looking, you stay out of that circle of light. Very simple, intuitive gamer logic. Beyond this, there's not too much left to compare Scorn's journey and Journey's journey in terms of narrative overlap for a while on Scorn's side. There is still quite a few additional things to discuss in relation to Journey, but Scorn, nothing particularly interesting happens until you come across the Crater Queen and you have to go through another separate area before you can even access that one. As with before, the next section in Journey is started out with a cutscene. The taller creature actually leans down to closer examine Journey Guy, almost out of curiosity or even sympathy. Then the next mural, mural segment showcases the Journey uh, civilization rise to technological power. They build great works of architecture and utilize the carpet creatures as a means of making the architecture and overall society and technology function. It's similar in a way to how human beings utilize natural resources in order to make our own societies function and flourish. In fact, arguably, that's going to be an inevitability for all of time. Where else are we going to get any means of making our machines work? Even if we move away from coal and stuff like that, we're still going to need nuclear materials or sunlight or wind. Unsurprisingly, this is also a major thematic element of Scorn, in which biology is literally used as a kind of technology. One of the most striking and apparent examples being the key and your own weapons. All of life is effectively just another tool, a means to an end, for that grand goal of ascension. The next segment we see in Journey is a landscape of pink sand and green sky. One very interesting design philosophy the developers had was they didn't want the sky to be blue in any segment except for the very end of the game. Almost like seeing an earthly blue sky was a reward in of itself. Despite the fact that the landscape is effectively the same as what you've traversed earlier, changing around the colors does a tremendous job at giving it its own identity. In fact, that's one of the primary criticisms I have with Scorn. The majority of the game takes place in the crater, which is there to do something. And throughout the majority of the game, what you're going to see is the exact same style Gagarian machinery, uh, creatures piling up in different locations, and thick green fog everywhere. 
In fact, that's in some ways what you also see in the prologue. Thus meaning your only reprieve from seeing exactly this is a brief segment in the Fields of Decay and Paulus, which is the end of the game. There's not much visual variety, which ends up making a huge chunk of the game feel like a single segment even if it can be arguably split into three. This might be one of the biggest reasons why Journey feels like the longer game. Having such striking visual distinctness, even if two of the levels are literally deserts, allows for each one to be more memorable. Now I understand why the crater area is so sameish. It is quite literally the same area. And why the same kind of aesthetic intensifies. You're going deeper and deeper into ground zero of where the creatures came from. And while I'd argue quite passionately that the crater area we got in the final game was mechanically and level designly a significant downgrade from what was in the Kickstarter demo, it is entirely possible that this major issue could be solved by just putting in more areas in Scorn, more areas with their own unique visual identity. It may be difficult to shove in areas like the Blasted Labyrinth and the Tower into what's already there, but I'm pretty sure Paulus could be easily reworked to be more expansive and lead to more significant areas. In any case, this area also introduces us to a new carpet creature that looks kind of like a kite. That's actually, strangely enough, one major similarity between Journey and Scorn. How the creatures look to be clear variations of each other. In Scorn, if you look at, say, the bear and kiwi and a uh, big boy, you can tell that they have the exact same kind of skin and flesh. In Journey, all of the creatures you see are these weird carpet creatures. Scorn's explanation for the similarity of all the creatures is that they all came from this much bigger creature, but I do kind of wonder what the explanation in Journey is. Did the carpet creatures undergo Darwinian evolution like life here on Earth? Did they simply spawn out of thin air like the murals suggested a little bit? Or were they products of a much bigger carpet creature? Who knows? When it comes to the individual areas in Journey and Scorn, the design philosophy is very different. Journey presents most of its areas as being these wide open spaces, especially in the beginning, where in order to stop players from going endlessly left or right, they need to have wind blowing the players away, and that kind of serves as a barrier. Meanwhile, Scorn primarily takes place in enclosed rooms with corridors and hallways, with maybe the occasional open hub space in the middle of it. There are still big individual areas, but there's just certain roads and lanes you can walk across, whereas with Journey, you're able to fly just about wherever you want. It isn't until later on after this, especially in the final level, I'd argue, that Journey becomes quite as linear in nature as Scorn, in the sense of there's a very specific path that you have to take from point A to point B. You can't loop around the whole environment and then decide to go to where you need to go. Up to this point, Journey was by all accounts whimsical and lighthearted. Even though there were tombstones littered throughout the sand, there wasn't any major implication of anything super evil going on. That changes with this area, which presents itself ominously as a darker, dust-coated series of ruins. In many ways, that's pretty similar to the field of decay Scorn Guy finds himself in in the start of his journey. He never really got the whimsical, light-hearted side of things. Immediately, everything just fucking sucks. And also visually, having these 
long-lost architectural and technological marvels of your species laying dormant amidst a sea of dust is not lost on me as a similarity between that section in Journey and this section in Scorn. The fact that the purpose of both of these buildings in Scorn and Journey are cruel and nefarious is also not lost on me, but we'll get to that just a little bit later. In this section, you'll likely hear the ongoing machinations of the long, uh, abandoned, autonomous machinery. The little carpet creature helps you get up, and then you see another carpet creature stuck within the window. Of course, you free it because you're just a great guy and who knows how he got there, but then you get to the next segment and you start to see kind of the darker side of this species history. There's now some context for the multitudes of dormant stone bodies. This is where they're produced, or at least where part of them is produced. And evidently they seem to be intertwined in one way or another with the carpet organisms. Perhaps even being that the carpet organisms are what's inside of the scary stone fish thing. Whereas previously you might have freed them just to lend a helping hand and be a swell guy, now you might be inclined to free them out of a sense of moral duty. They are innocent, benevolent creatures who need your help. And the ones still stuck within the stone bodies are almost calling out to you to free them from their turmoil. The next mural this almost ever-present guide shows us gives an insight into the catalyst for the decline of the civilization. Basically, they got greedy. They continue to grow and grow and grow and expand without any consideration for how that might affect the resources that are required in order to keep society functioning and flourishing. It's a not-so-subtle environmental ASOP. Available resources of the natural world, in this case land, are eaten up, and in place at the absolute apex are now the journey creatures, the high rulers of that civilization. But of course it's Journey, so it can't be too dark, so here's a segment where all of the carpet creatures manage to get out and it's just wonderful and whimsical and amazing. They're no longer trapped, they're free. And they'll help you get to the next area because they're just such wonderful little scrimblows. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about how the attitude Scorn Society has to other living creatures is pretty much the exact same in an even more over-the-top, cruel, and unusual manner. Living things, especially this lower tier of organism known as mold people, are to be butchered, melted, restructured, packaged, whatever needs be for whatever endeavor the larger Scorn Society is trying to achieve. Given that the Abate Assembly seems to be below the area where Scorn people are metamorphosized into this aristocrat class, it's pretty safe to say that multitudes of mold men have been sacrificed for the sake of one or very few aristocrats. Countless individuals who aren't even born to die, the living part of their life cycle is the immense inconvenience that scorn society simply must suffer before correcting it. And it seems that a few scorn people have even perished on the job and were just left to rot, laying there endlessly until moved. And where Journey Guy goes out of his way to free these suffering, entrapped creatures, the character we play as in the prologue, who would go on to be the parasite, is not so kind, as evident by how he treats everybody's favorite scorn character, Mold Man. Mold Man clearly has a childlike and innocent demeanor. But what does childlike mean to a species that grow out of walls? 
Instead, Mold Man is simply a resource to be used and disposed of, whether scooping him and just utilizing his arm, or freeing him and forcing him to partake in the necessary steps to open a single door, then to be left behind for who knows how long until he starves to death. And that's just a single instance between two individuals. Imagine the conveyor belt of cruelty, the industrialized suffering that must have occurred when society was still functional. And for those who want to cope, there's no reason to assume that Scorn Guy, the game's protagonist, feels any real sympathy for the Crater Queen as he extends bridges deep within her guts. She was, like many other creatures, simply in the way. So, after a whimsical moment where you're literally carried to the next spot by the flying carpet creatures, because this is a fun, light-hearted universe that isn't Scorn's, you get to go on a fun sand sledding ride where you slide down a bunch of sand and you can try to go through the arches if you want. I think there's even an achievement for going through all of the arches. And you get to see a rather beautiful striking vista of tans and browns and golds and other pleasant colors. In fact, after seeing the absolutely traumatizing treatment these poor carpet creatures were subjected to, it's only natural that you're going to want to go down some sand and have a bit of fun, something to lighten the mood and take your mind off of the abject cruelty. In Scorn, there's only one real moment that A. progresses you through the world and B. is something of a breather moment. And that's the tram ride to Paulus. Take note, this is after you've effectively murderized the Crater Queen in what's arguably the most difficult area in the game. The area that puts your ability to either hide away, run away from, or outright kill and slaughter enemies at its greatest test. Narratively, this tram ride is also required in order to separate Paulus from the Abate Assembly and the Crater, as if it's a special area that's not supposed to be influenced by the down and dirty happenings of the rest of Scorn's world. There's also a part during the tram ride where the atmosphere is completely closed off from your view, which allows for it to then change to the more serene, a peaceful atmosphere that's featured in Paulus. That being said, it is a very sudden switch. Literally this tiny ass little segment of tunnel here, and then all of a sudden, suddenly there's no more pink haze to be found. Maybe there's just some giant fan somewhere blowing away the hostile atmosphere. In any case, this also represents a complete shift in the architecture and color palette that you find, making it an actually distinct level compared to what we've seen throughout the crater and the abate assembly, as well as the fields of decay. Where Scorn's uh, On the Rails ride represents moving the player strictly from point A to point B and allowing for a change in scenery, the one in Journey does genuinely seem to be there to show off some more visual and artistic beauty. The tram ride is rather enclosed and you don't see much left or right to you, but here they make full use of the late afternoon golden hour color palette, and the vibrant desert it resides over. And once again, you're invited to free these carpet creatures from their hostile enclosure, and knowing what they were used for by the society that once was, you, as I said before, it's no longer so much as offering a helping hand as much as it is deliberately righting a wrong. These creatures are so thankful that you opted to help them that they band together and utilize themselves to help you over the wall and continue on your journey. 
This is also the last time you actually do this. Go from a hostile machine piece to hostile machine piece and free these things. The next segment is another sand sledding sh segment. But this time, due to the visuals, the lighting, the sparkling in the sand, the golden aura that illuminates everything, paired with the optimistic musical cues that plays during this segment, makes it one of the most memorable moments in the entire game, and one that a lot of the fan art that's been made of the game specifically depicts. It's an almost triumphant ride, even though you're sledding through the ruins of the civilization of your species that committed so many wrongs in its reign. You pass by multitudes of derelict arches and buildings and cityscapes, but rather than being a somber moment, it's almost an uplifting moment, as if you're able to put aside the whole of the civilization's history and the wrongs that came with it, and are venturing off to something new and better. After all, you are still heading for the mountain. When I said before that Journey seems like a game that the developers were aware would not exist again, after all, graphically it still holds up due to the simplistic cartoony art style. It's moments like this that make me think that's exactly what the developers were thinking. The level of lighting and vibrancy, the amount of Kino in this scene alone would have killed a gamer in the NES days. Your eyes are blessed with the spectacle of some of the best use of warm colors in all of gaming. A truly magnificent moment that I think would be memorized for years to come by people who played this game. And one of the moments that gets gamers playing it again and again. But of course, nothing good lasts forever and as you slide down, the colors start to get a little bit darker. Suddenly it's not yellow and oranges, suddenly it's a little bit purples and pinks. There's still the occasional golden shimmer, yes, but it's very clear we've reached the end of our journey for lighter colors as we tumble down further and further into the ruins of civilization. Now it's time to see what the game can do with cool colors. The blues, the greens, the purples. Now we get to discover what the depths of the civilization look like. I know I've kind of made fun of Journey for having a moment of reprieve after such a stunningly dark turn of events, but the fact remains, the scene where you see those machines being built is a darker tone than what we've seen in the rest of the game. Scorn doesn't really have a real shift in tone. It can be described as, and then it got worse. Now, I'm not asking for a fantastical moment of sunshine and rainbows and puppies in the world of Scorn, though it would be interesting to see what that would even look like, but consider the fact that in Scorn there's a losing condition. And the losing conditions really truly start when you get to the crater and have to contend with the bears and kiwis and big boys you find down there. Not only is that the majority of the game, but the area also becomes harder the deeper down into it you go. All three segments from when you first arrive to the very end of the Crater Queen segment. Then there's a brief tram ride before you go to a place where really the only thing you can do is go straight to a boss fight. I'm going to spoil Journey just a little bit here because I think it's important to clarify. Following the sand ride, you then go to this kind of cold, gloomy underground area where you first encounter the stone creatures. Then you go to this fantastical kind of palace of light. Then you're at the mountain, you have to brave the harsh winter cold, as well as a segment with some of the stone creatures before you're climbing up 
and your character almost doesn't make it. Then your character ascends beyond to the top of the mountain and it's this wonderful, whimsical series of events. There's differences in tone. There's low points, high points, lowest point, and then the highest point. Journey is indeed an incredibly simple game mechanically, but it does try to squeeze out as much as it can from the mechanics. Following sliding down some sand, the game introduces you to avoiding getting detected by the stone creatures. Then there's a series of platforming challenges. Then there's a series of challenges where you need to shuffle your way behind an object while a big gust of wind is blowing and wait for the gust of wind to stop and then go behind the next object. Despite being far more complex mechanically than Journey, Scorn makes very little use of its more complex mechanics beyond either hiding from creatures or shooting them. The vast majority of the crater area is combat or hiding, fight or flight, broken up only briefly in the very first area by a set of puzzles, and then the very last thing you do in the crater area is a puzzle but the rest of it is exactly the same. What's kind of interesting to me is that in the 2020 trailer, you see one of those spinning light puzzles in the second area of the crater. You also, by that point, have both the pistol and the shotgun, and you get the grenade launcher there too. In other words, the amount of tools at your disposal is greater in previous builds of the game, and it seems like the gunplay versus puzzle uh, mechanics, gameplay, whatever, were much better spaced out than they are in the final build. You don't even get the grenade launcher until the very end of the game. And that thing is going to be used at minimum four times. One to open up the cage for the last homunculi, once to kill the boss, wants to open up another sliding door, and wants to disrupt the uh, cyborg conveyor belt. Compare that with the 2020 gameplay trailer, where it was used to take out the ceiling penises and to attack the enemies. It was a far more mechanically interesting and useful item in previous builds, so even though Scorn is mechanically more complex than Journey, the way it implements those mechanics feels like a lot of wasted potential, which just makes a game feel that much shorter. If you had a room that was like the Fields of Decay, maybe that's what the Blasted Labyrinth would be. Kind of a maze-ish area where you solve puzzles in order to progress further, and then that leads to a boss fight with the cranes, that would have made the game feel significantly fuller just by virtue of having more uses with the mechanics, more downtime in between combat heavy sections. It also would have helped the lore significantly because I still don't get why there's an assembly line of cyborgs that are immediately hostile to you directly below the holy temple that leads you to ascension. That's like having a cloning lab of Chris Hansen's underneath the Vatican. In fact, all things considered, despite puzzles supposed to be a major part of Scorn, once you finish the Crater Queen area, that's the last puzzle you do in the game. All of Paulus is two boss fights, running back and forth from a machine that clamps down on your arm and something you need your arm to use, and then slowly waddling over to a thing where you then engage in the switching mechanic, which by that point is effectively the very end of the game. Another mechanic that makes Scorn more complex in Journey, but because it's so underutilized, it might as well not even be there. So, I suppose one reason Journey feels longer than Scorn is because A, 
it balances out the different gameplay mechanics it engages in. Some exploration, some freeing the carpet creatures, some sliding down sand, and, you know, whatever it can do with what little it has, while Scorn makes use very little of a lot of its interesting mechanics. And B, Journey tends to break up the gameplay and general mood sections of the game far better than Scorn does. You combine that with the fact that every area in Journey looks different compared to each other, whereas so many of the areas in Scorn, by virtue of the architecture and color palette, look exactly the same, it's no wonder why Journey feels longer. At this point, I think the greater mystery is solved. We now know why Journey feels a lot longer than Scorn, but it might still be worth continuing down the narrative line of Journey's plot and cross-comparing moments to Scorn, because maybe there's some additional information to glean out of it. The following cutscenes shows what ultimately led to the downfall of their civilization, All Out War. It's interesting that the taller figure doesn't even look at Journey Guy this time, as if spending the brief moment mourning before showcasing the turn of events. Power went out as resources depleted, and they argued over what scarce resources were left. If they could not share, they fought. And instead of trying to find a mutually beneficial solution, they instead utilized what little they had left to killing the other side, hoping to be able to alleviate the scarcity that way. It's a tale as old as time and one that's been here throughout all of human existence. The tale has many iterations, for example, Thanos' major plan to snap half of the universe out of existence is just that at a universal scale. The simple notion that if there's only so much food, it won't run out as quickly if the other guy is dead. According to Scorn's art book, the Blasted Labyrinth was the end result of a war between the Humunculi, where two different factions of them couldn't agree over who should take over and rule Paulus, ending up murdering each other while leaving the temple city relatively untouched. Unfortunately, the Blasted Labyrinth is not in the game, nor is the narrative, so it cannot necessarily be applicable to Scorn. Your character finds himself in the lowest depths of the city, where the only source of light is that which breaks through the cracks of the ceiling above. With everything being colorful and vibrant above, now you find yourself walking on dark blue sand in a dark blue room, the only light color being the occasional white sand illuminated by those scarce few lights. You find yourself in an area that's actually very reminiscent of being underwater, as if by this point you're almost wandering through Atlantean ruins. I've said before that some of the carpet creature designs are effectively similar to various oceanic life, and the way your character jumps and floats about is almost like your character is swimming. Well, now you get kind of a logical conclusion to that sort of design philosophy. An underwater level without actually being underwater. By this point in time, if you were keen on collecting these glyphs, you should have enough scarf length in order to float and fly about for a much more extended period of time. You're swimming, but you're not actually swimming. Underwater levels are the sort of thing that garners groans from gamers, because more often than not, mechanically, they're just not particularly fun to play through. Journey cleverly fixes this by just having the underwater level be no different gameplay-wise than the surface level stuff. It is such an interesting way of subverting the usual problems that come with making an underwater level that I almost wonder why more game developers don't try to do this. Why is your character able to move just as well underwater as on land? 
Because he just can, okay? Don't think about it too much. But of course, this isn't a true underwater level, it's just designed to look like one. So perhaps other games don't do that because they don't have that benefit of the doubt about the fact that your character isn't actually in the ocean. Nonetheless, the Journey devs have seen fit to really uh, sell that appearance, even introducing a new carpet creature, the seaweed ones and these jellyfish-looking ones. Now, surprise, surprise, Scorn doesn't have an equivalent of this. But I almost wonder if it could. Perhaps having a section especially covered in thick blue fog with very scarce lights and maybe some kind of meaty equivalent to various oceanic creatures floating and shifting around within it. The fact that your character can't even jump would alleviate at least a lot of the difficulty that comes from implementing the movements of an underwater area. However, obviously I'm not going to hold it against Scorn that it doesn't have any section like this. It's more of a fun brainstorming exercise than an actual critique of Scorn. In fact, the closest thing to a criticism I can levy would just be retreading the fact that Journey has vastly different looking areas and Scorn quite frankly does not. But we've gone over that already. I've said it before, probably once and twice by now, but Journey really does seem like the kind of game that the developers knew would never be made again. And you even see this from this kind of underwater section where at the beginning, it was more of a dark blue color. Here, you're kind of getting into a more teal color scheme. And later on, there's going to be more of like a kind of dark blue-green mix color scheme. It's actually quite fascinating how they managed to make so much variation from something so simple as what the overall fog and wall color is. But here we find ourselves in what seems to be the main production assembly for these machines of war. I engage in a little bit of gamer fun where rather than taking the room seriously as a component of the narrative and overall plot, I instead try to climb onto the uppermost level and then climb onto one of these machines of war just because I want to try it, okay? and I do succeed in getting up there. I find it interesting that component at the very top of the screen there actually occasionally spins, a small detail implying that production is still happening in this room long after everything lays dormant that I think most people would likely miss if they aren't engaging in this gamer tomfoolery. I mean, we've seen evidence of that in a prior area, but it's nice that the developers were able to ensure that that is also made clear here, where so many of these things now fully shown are present. We also get the first glimpse of one of these things in action, as it violently murderizes one of these poor carpet creatures. I've mentioned before, but when these things attack you, they don't really kill you, they just take away your scarf. Your scarf being made of the same material as those carpet creatures. Oh, and here's the green I was talking about. The game has no losing condition, it just punishes you by restricting your ability to jump. But by doing it that way, the game almost explains in-universe the fact it doesn't have a losing condition. They aren't really concerned about you, they're concerned about your carpet supply, because that's what was being fought over by the various factions to begin with. It's such a strange and esoteric detail that I wouldn't be surprised if the vast majority of gamers didn't clue into this. Then again, the uh, kind of mechanic of avoiding being detected by them is so simple that the vast majority of gamers probably never had to think about it. Journey is a walking simulator after all, so having to put in any segment that might 
complicate going from point A to point B would kind of go against the game's design philosophy. Meanwhile, as said before, Scorn has a losing condition, which might, despite all the criticisms of Scorn being a walking simulator, be one of the major reasons why it could not classify as a walking simulator. There's a handful of things that can kill you in Scorn's world. There's the fertilizer drones in the prologue area, there's the crater creatures, there's the parasite taking away chunks of your health, there's the arm clasp thing, and there's the humunculi, crane, cyborg, whatevers. All of these, I think, make sense in Scorn's narrative one way or another. The fertilizer drones are spraying out some unknown substance that could be corrosive to Scorn Guy. The crater creatures are effectively animals and you've wandered into their territory. And in fact, if you stay back and let them waddle away, they won't bother you again. The Krangs are clearly a hostile race to Scorn beings, and you've effectively put something immobile into a suit that allows it to fight back, though it does seem a bit odd that you would do that and not just puncture the Krang capsule while it's sitting there immobile. The arm clamps are a device that physically inflicts pain, and the parasite is a douchebag. It all makes sense. The only thing Scorn can't really account for is the fact that you can die and respawn. Initially, Scorn was going to have these save stations that you could only use once, and I almost wonder if in initially they were intending to have some kind of ludo-narrative synergy between the fact that you can die and come back to life in the game's overall world. Similar to, say, the genetic pods from Bioshock, which just rematerializes you from latent DNA of Andrew Ryan after you die. It's certainly not a major problem for Scorn or its overall narrative. In fact, you can argue that the fact you died means you played through the story incorrectly. If the story were to play out exactly as it should, you wouldn't have died at all. So it's just setting you back so you can continue through the story properly. The final section for this kind of underwater looking area is supposed to be this moment where you sort of slide down a hill and two of the uh, stone creatures immediately detect you and are about to attack you before you manage to go into this kind of lit up shrine area and that deflects the creatures away thus saving you from being hit. However, I decide to engage again in some gamer tomfoolery, and instead of doing things the way the developers intended me to do, I instead see if I could just fly down the entire hill and avoid the whole spectacle. It's interesting that a game as simplistic as Journey can be broken so thoroughly, but that's simply due to the ability to jump. One of the reasons I would argue Scorn is so tight mechanically and not able to be broken so easily is because your character is permanently glued to the ground. Something about the Z-axis just really fucks with a game. Another amusing thing I discovered during this playthrough is you can actually go back. There's a lot of gravestones here, kind of implying that this was a really perilous area for these journeymen. But I was legitimately surprised that the game allows you to go back up here, because I always kind of assumed that light barrier was a way for the game to kind of lock you into going forward. In any case, you can see the stark contrast between this and the rest of the area, and it only becomes greater. The next cutscene plays out, and you've gone ever closer to the mountain that both you and the taller figure are gazing towards. It looks at you, almost asking if the journeyman really is ready, before showcasing one of the last murals in the game this time showing the grim end result of all-out war. As it turns out, no one won.
In the desolation of the aftermath of death and destruction, desert reigned supreme, coating over countless years of culture and architecture, and the sky once again is filled with spirits. But curiously, you come in to play. I've said before, this whole thing seems somewhat cyclical, like multitudes of journeymen have made this journey before, some successful, some not. I think Journey gives a perfect blend between definitive statements about the game's lore and history, and an openness to interpretation about what exactly went on and what role you play in the larger scheme of things. The whole next segment, much like the sand sliding segment, is a display of visual and audio kino at such magnitude it would have murdered a gamer back in the NES days. Whereas previously your character was delving deeper and deeper into the depths of the ruins of civilization, now here in this kind of temple area, your character is going to go up further, higher, and do so in the warmth of some esoteric light. I've harped on this many times, but again, a moment like this really makes me think the developers were aware that a game like this wouldn't exist again, and I don't think people quite appreciate what that means. Consider a developer working on a World War II first-person shooter. Those are practically a dime a dozen these days, Anyone working on a new one can readily expect that down the line, a few years later, another one would emerge. That's not necessarily the same with Journey. Journey's visual style, its world, its gameplay, is unique, even if it is simplistic. And here we see a kind of challenge area, where you're supposed to use the various creatures you've encountered along the way, like these kind of minnow carpet creatures, in order to platform throughout this temple area and reach the next mural. In fact, the whole temple is like this, almost being a final trial for any journeyman wanting to truly scale the mountain. How well do you know the kit you use? And with each mural you unlock, you see just a little bit of the areas you went to before. Again, really making me think that this is a cyclical sort of chain of events. That your character isn't the first one to go here, and might not even be the last. What is strange about this, though, is you don't use these creatures to really traverse any part of the mountain itself. So it's not like a training course for what's to come, but instead just a rite of passage to prove that you've truly earned going to this temple, climbing it, and able to get to the mountain at all. Now, I didn't necessarily earn it this playthrough because I have the ultra OP white and gold robes that give me the full jumping capabilities, but for gamers playing through this area the first time, it could prove to be a unique challenge, one that requires them to have some sort of mastery over the albeit simplistic challenges they faced along the way. True to the fact there is no losing condition in Journey, once you've fallen off, you don't go all the way back to the bottom and have to redo each challenge, challenge by challenge. Instead, this ocean of light kind of serves as a perpetual charge for your scarf. You're able to just jump up indefinitely until you breach the surface. This area stands in stark contrast to both the previous and next area extremely well. The previous area in the sense that this area has a lot of warm colors, a lot of reds, oranges, yellows, and illuminated browns, whereas the previous area was a lot of cool colors, blues, teals, and greens. The next area is extremely desaturated, a lot of kind of darkish, grayish uh, rocks, snow, not a lot of vibrancy to gaze upon, whereas here, 
everything's extremely illuminated and saturated. The previous area, the only light source was that which was able to poke through a hole in the ceiling. This area itself is the light source. The next area is a frigid, cold environment, while this area looks like it's pleasantly warm, maybe even a bit humid. The previous area was full of ruins and wreckage, while everything in this area looks to be exactly how it's supposed to be. The strong contrast in visual identity between these different areas, even if individually they're short and simplistic, takes up that much more of your memory to remember the distinction and makes it feel much bigger than it actually is. This area also introduces the last of the variations of the carpet creature, this huge whale-looking one, most visually similar to the stone creatures we've seen. Thus, what we've seen are carpet creatures that look like minnows, seaweed, squids, whales, and jellyfish. Like I've said before, there's a lot of oceanic imagery in a game that has no actual water level. In fact, in many ways, this room is also kind of a functional water level due to the fact you can jump infinitely swimming when you're bathed in the golden cloud. The whale, as far as I can tell, was the last real challenge there was for this, and it's effectively just get on it, balance, and ride it. Now, this part here seems more like a little victory lap than anything. Maybe there is a challenge of staying on the carpet, but given the fact the carpet perpetually uh, restores your scarf jumping power, any mistake of falling off can be quickly rectified, especially if you were the kind of gamer who went out of his way to grab as many of the sigils as you can. It's almost as if the game is saying, congratulations, you beat the challenge, here's your reward getting to the very next area and seeing the last of these murals, and surprise, surprise, it's a sand sliding mural the apex of excitement from the previous things you've done. Because while this room does share many of the color scheme elements that made the sand sliding section so beautiful, it does come off as more somber than exciting. One really interesting thing I've noticed is the way it's set up is actually the same as the level select area at the beginning of the game. I'm pretty sure the murals are in the exact same spot as well. That's something I hadn't noticed in any of my previous playthroughs of the game, and for a game that's like an hour and a half long, I had prior to this playthrough 11 hours in it. So it is quite something when a game so simple still manages to provide some fun surprises and details you didn't recognize on previous playthroughs. For anyone who wants to get this game and play it, I would highly recommend getting all of the sigils on your first run so you can unlock the white and gold robes and play through the game again but with a lot more freedom of movement. Even though I recorded this footage mainly to just showcase a game so I can cross compare it with Scorn, there have been multiple times where I've just kind of stood around and admired the scenery. But, just like with the level select area, the only way to go forward to really progress from point A to point B to point C without skipping a step is to go across a bridge in the central structure. Of course, here we'll also have to go through a cutscene showcasing one last meeting between our character and the giant roped figure before we ascend the mountain. You can see this one has a lot more spectacle. It doesn't just fade to white and then boom, you're in that kind of area with the white roped figure. Now you have this smaller cutscene as a prelude. 
Prior to getting to that room in Journey, like I said before, your character was descending down further and further into the depths of the lower reaches of the civilization, and I suppose you could argue that's effectively what Scorn Guy is doing in Scorn when he's traversing through the crater. In fact, I think the achievement you get when you reach the Crater Queen room is something like the lowest point. Actually, I just checked and it is, in fact, the lowest most point. With that in mind, I suppose you can argue the tram ride and ultimately reaching Paulus for the first time scratches that same itch. You're now in a radically different area than the absolute depths of civilization, one that looks calming, peaceful, and serene, as if the threat of everything is behind you. Ignoring the fact that all of this exists strictly for a set of boss fights, a health resource managing minigame, and then the introduction of the switching mechanics before the game just outright ends, I do genuinely think this does meet the same standard that Journey did. It looks completely different than the previous area, both in terms of the color palette and the architectural style. While it still has a Gagirian flair to it, it no longer looks factorial and industrial, but instead spiritual. Another stark contrast with everything previously is the overt sexual imagery, which was absent in all of the previous parts of Scorn, save perhaps for the nudity of some of the mold people. In fact, it was so absent in previous areas that I recall when the game was being developed, there were people kind of half-jokingly, half-seriously arguing that the game couldn't be inspired by H.R. Giger because there's no sexual imagery to be found. Honestly, what I should do is maybe go back through some of my older videos and even see when I started talking about how the custom, mature description that Ebb Software would have added was updated, because it could be that was updated after they decided to merge both Part 1 and Part 2, indicating that Paulus really was strictly a Part 2 area. So yes, stylistically, Paulus does count as a major change in pace from what we've seen earlier. It's just a shame that it's then overshadowed by a couple of boss fights that, quite frankly, we know don't belong there, and then the game ends. There's nothing further to explore or see. The cutscene starts with a face-to-face -face between the two figures, whereas the taller one typically is looking away for the previous showings. The history of Journey Civilization has been shown. There's nothing more, except for the history that your character made going on his journey. It's a small game, a short game, but a scene like this really helps make it feel that much larger, where you see the highs and the lows of the uh, journey you went through. A combination of all the murals that you unlocked ascending this temple area, and then a glimpse at the challenge to come. One that, even if your character doesn't so much have a face, you can still somewhat read a concerned expression about what challenges he has next. Does he expect to overcome them? Does he think he'll perish on his journey before reaching the tip of the mountain? In many ways, it seems like you haven't even started on your journey to the mountain. You're at the base of the mountain. Now it's time to climb it. With the final leg on your pilgrimage to go, the gates open to the frosty, frigid world ahead, and you must leave behind the tranquil, warm light of the temple. And it's your choice to make. You're not being dropped down like you were from the sand sledding. But you must persevere and go forward. You were born to do this, after all. Being the final area in the game, it's unsurprising that Paulus doesn't offer anything similar in Scorn. 
And given that the city is so far removed from the riffraff of the crater, there's no chance of getting a sort of bird's eye view of everything you've done and endured to get to that point. In some ways, it seems almost odd there isn't a map of some sort of Scorn's world, a way to bring context to the chaos that is the series of architectures you come across. Given there's no cutscenes or dialogue in the base game itself, save for the beginning and ending, the only way that you can really convey where everything is in relation to each other would be some form of map. There could have been a mural on the wall of Paulus showing off the various areas you've been to, and maybe a few areas you haven't, just to expand upon the game's world and make it feel more like an actual place that existed and functioned than what's effectively born out of a wall and walk straight to the big sex city. There is that one mural that kind of shows an ascended figure uh, managing to link an aristocrat body with one of the sentry shells, but given that you yourself don't ascend in the game or even turn into one of the aristocrats, it's functionally and kind of narratively pointless. And as I've said before, I'm of the view that the murals were haphazardly and hastily conceptualized and developed. The scene starts out with Journey Guy boldly and defiantly walking forward to the fridgy world ahead of him. Even with such a cold, desolate landscape, the developers go out of their way to make things look at least somewhat beautiful. But it's very clear this is a hostile landscape, one not fit for life. You see the occasional small patch of carpet creature growing out of the ground that can provide some temporary relief and warmth, but it quickly turns back to ice the moment you leave its vicinity. You can see here I'm trying to jump, but unfortunately, Due to the nature of this area, it's actually quite difficult to maintain a jump, even with uh, a full scarf. And then you see one of the stone creatures attack one of the carpet creatures and knock it down to the ground. Of course, by this point, you're quite accustomed to helping those little guys. So you might run over, jump over, do what you can to close a distance and get it back in the air, but... Unfortunately, you're blown away by a huge gust of wind that prevents you from offering any assistance. And even when you do manage to overcome that and get close to it, close enough that it's in the vicinity of your call, or even if you're standing right next to it, there's no helping it. That thing's done. It's dead. There's nothing you can do to save that creature whereas you are able to save everything else. In some very small way, the stakes have been raised tremendously. The challenge you face here is novel to the game, even if it isn't particularly difficult. Just wait until the visual wind effects stop showing themselves, and then you move up to the next tombstone and rinse and repeat until you get to the very end. You can try to play it a little bit cheeky and go past two or maybe even three at a time, but of course at some point you're going to have to stop. There's no one and done speedrun of this sex section. It's actually a little bit funny how much the game kind of goes out of its way to avoid having any really super uh, downward moments, because right after the section where you've effectively failed to save one of the carpet creatures, there's another one hiding out here that you can actually call to, and that helps it spring to life and fly around. It's almost like the developers are saying, yeah, that last section was a bit of a downer, so now you can have a little buddy on your journey, assuming that you're playing alone and no other player managed to spawn in with you which is something that can happen in Journey. 
I didn't mention it because it's not really relative comparing Journey to Scorn, but can happen. And here you see the flying stone creature continuing to move about, a sign that you're going to have to contend against it at some point down the line, so prepare yourself. Given how immensely hostile this area is to life, especially given all the tombstones that litter the mountain every step of the way, it does kind of make me wonder how they've managed to construct anything up here. Maybe in better days they had more formidable tools than just a single scarf that quickly depletes in the cold. And they actually give you a little bit of a reprieve from the cold. They have this little light area temple place with some flying scarf creatures to kind of break up the monotony of not being able to fly around with a full scarf. There's also a mural here, but interestingly, the depiction of stuff is kind of grayed out and desaturated. Even the murals are dead on the mountain. I quite like the area in the next section here because it is pretty neat to see just a little bit of context of how far you've come climbing up the mountain so far. You can see the area you've been at previously by just looking down, and you can see how much further you have to go by looking up. It's just a neat little set piece in my opinion. It's also, funnily enough, possible to fall off the bridge and have to work your way back here all over again. Perhaps being the most punishing part in the entire game. Now here comes, in this section here, what's effectively the final boss of the game if you can even call it that. A combination of the wind pushing mechanics and avoiding the gaze of the creatures. It's not difficult in the least, just time your stuff correctly, but it is kind of interesting to see for the first time two things that you had to learn how to uh, handle in previous segments being conjoined into a single challenge. Like with the underwater looking area, it is possible to play funny gamer games and avoid this challenge entirely by veering very far to the left, but I decided to play it as the developers intended, just for some fun and to get some good footage. When I say this is the final boss of the game, that doesn't mean it's a final obstacle the game has to offer if obstacles truly mean anything in a game with no actual losing condition. There's going to be one more segment that focuses heavily on this sort of red light, green light, the wind is activated and you're going to be fighting against it, versus the wind is not, and therefore you can move forward unobstructed. But given the narrative significance of these flying stone creatures and what they represent in the ultimate downfall of Journey's civilization, I would constitute this as a boss fight, even if you aren't directly confronting the horrors at B. The fact that it's combined with the wind-pushing mechanics also kind of elevates it a little bit. I've commented before how interesting it is that the work you did in that light temple doesn't really come into play here. Instead, strangely enough, dropping down into the depths of civilization has prepared you far more for this moment than that whole trial. Whereas everything in that trial was intentional, someone had to build it and set it up and stuff, falling into that a ruinous zone was completely accidental. It's probably not even supposed to be accessible from that area. So strangely enough, the stuff you stumble into in life can sometimes be far more useful to your journey than the things that are pre-prepared to help you in life. Though, of course, that could be reading just a little bit too much into this funny scarf game. The way this area handles color is also very well done. The overwhelming majority of it is the same kind of whitish color 
with the little stone blocks you can hide in being the standout things you see. You can immediately beeline towards one. Meanwhile, the light that represents the stone creature's vis vision is extremely visible, giving you a clear idea of where it begins and it ends. Once you get to this block here though, you're basically home free. Run forward under the arch, and the final boss battle ends. Scorn also has boss fights. In fact, it has two. One with two phases, one with only a single phase. And like the incredibly video gamey boss fight in Journey, where it's just stay out of the enemy's cone of vision or circle vision, Scorn's is dodge a boss's attacks until it runs out of ammo and exposes its weak point. However, narratively, Scorn's boss fights are night and day worse than Journey. With Journey, the boss fight involved the flying stone creatures, whose remnants you have seen throughout your journey, saving carpet creatures from their encasing. All of the darker points in Journey involve those stone creatures, uh, production assembly facilities, or the ones that were patrolling around in that underground area. Hell, in the grand schemes of things, they're weapons of war that are ultimately responsible for bringing down the journey civilization in general. So, to be confronted with a pair of them at the very end of your journey, the force that brought down an empire, and defiantly not allowing it to stop your crusade to reach the tip of the mountain, that means something. But what does the boss fight in Scorn mean, other than kind of gross baby juicer? You haven't seen a homunculi before, it's just another goofy gross scrimblo. You haven't seen any of the cyborgs before, they just kind of now exist all of the sudden. None of this has any real relevance to the narrative itself, and it scorns two and only boss fights back to back where you're fighting basically clones of the boss itself. Hell, if Paulus really is a part two area, this fucker shouldn't even be here in the first place objectively, because there was concept of a helm all the way back when Scorn was just working on part one. So it really is superfluous and meaningless. Perhaps one could argue that the section where you have to clasp your hand in order to free it from the parasite so you can utilize different machinery that requires your left hand is a final boss. After all, you are directly confronting the parasite itself in a, your own way. You're taking back some control that you lost due to the parasite's growing influence. The problem is that the parasite is never ultimately overcome. At the very end, it returns and attacks you. There's also this extremely contrived fact that once you get your arm clamped, you can't rush back to the sentries and put that vial of red liquid in its proper place. It honestly seems like a missed opportunity since that could have been used to basically branch a game off and have an alternate ending. And given just how unsatisfying the ending of Scorn is, having an alternative definitely seems like something the game should have. In any case, you're just rushing back and forth from one machine to another, not really making any real progress on your journey towards ascension, but instead just continuously trying to get rid of a problem. It's made all the worse because one of the rooms offers a really lovely view of some extra areas in Polis that you'll never be able to explore. It's kind of funny, you get to explore even less of the ruins of Journey's world, but because Journey feels like the longer game, you don't really think about it too much. If there were far more to scorn after you remove the parasite, 
Even if the ending is the same ultimately, that might be a little bit different. But in actuality, once you remove the parasite, you basically walk from point A to point B, then interact with a new mechanic that's never brought up or utilized again, then you walk forward and it's game over, we're done. Arguably, Journey is fairly similar in the sense that immediately after that quote-unquote boss section, there's one more section where you interact with the red light, green light, wind problem before you effectively just move forward in a straight line and then the game is over. Except the game isn't over, there's a segment at the very end that you go through before you end up at a point where you just walk in a straight line and then the game is over. Journey does a fairly neat little bit of camera work where it zooms out as you walk across this crevice, seeing some more tombstones along the way. Scorn also engages in fun little camera works where some of the machines give you a third person perspective, giving you a little bit of a glimpse of you using it in the process. In Journey's case, it's probably to help you navigate through that section given how same-ish the color scheme of the rocks are. It can really blend together and confuse you if you're not being careful. The next challenge, so-called, is you climbing up these uh, seaweed carpet creatures in order to ascend higher into the mountain. A challenge like this offers the chance to have the player move completely vertically while still maintaining a notion of it being an arduous journey. By this point though, it really is impossible to jump well. You can see me trying and instead of jumping, which doesn't give me the kind of range of movement that previous sections allowed, I opt just to walk up the stairs rather than fly above them gracefully. There's also a very sudden shift in lighting you've probably noticed where the stone becomes even darker and the snow grayer. The transition, I would argue, is definitely less graceful than what we've seen before. Is it manipulative in a way? Yeah, but does it work for what's supposed to be the final challenge of the game? Also, yes. Despite Journey clearly being a walking simulator, one might actually experience some trouble during this section. The frame of the window of opportunity to move forward before the wind begins blowing again is significantly tighter here in this section than it is at any of the other points where you contend with that mechanic, especially climbing up these stairs. I've had times where I just kept getting blown back down no matter how much I tried descending. And this section right here can also just really screw you over. Which I guess the developers even anticipated because if you get blown down, that's not a losing condition. You just fall right down here in a lower section and you can take the alternative route to the very end. Where it's possible to soft lock yourself during Scorn's final challenge by losing too much health that the next time you clamp down on your arm, you're going to die anyways, it's impossible to be soft locked in Journey. Like I said before, even if the creatures hit you a bunch of time, you just lose length of your scarf, and that's not necessarily mandatory to completing the game. While, in terms of gameplay, this section isn't particularly interesting, it's quite literally just hold forward on your controller until your character ultimately stops moving, they do go out of their way to put in as much visual excitement as they possibly can, having your character shoved around by the harsh winds as he slowly and surely tries and struggles ever more to ascend to the peak of the mountain, a challenge that seems now downright impossible due to the weather at hand. 
The peak of the mountain itself doesn't even seem all that much closer than when you first got to this area. And as you go further up, it becomes, oddly enough, more and more obscured by the fog. As if the closer you get to it, the further away it becomes. As emotionally charged as this scene is, I can't help but to feel that this is a part of the game that I least enjoy playing through again, simply due to the fact it really is a glorified cutscene where you just hold up on the controller, so it's not even like an auto thing, you still have to do some input. And it also takes a while when the character slows down to ultimately collapse. There's only so much you can really do to make this interesting during a second time. One thing that you'll see me do here is kind of rotate the camera around, because I was trying to check if I remembered correctly that there's a point in time where the mountain disappears and all you can really see is like a wall ahead of you. And indeed right here you can see the mountain has disappeared and coming up pretty soon will be this huge, uh, very clearly artificial structure just barely visible over the horizon. This is supposed to be the emotional low point for your character, so close and yet so far away. And now there's a literal wall between him and his goal. He can't even see his goal anymore. All that's really left visible to him is that wall. After trekking through deserts and ruins and overcoming the stone creature, your character dies. Scorn also has something similar, where at the parasite removal machine, the parasite does a chestburster maneuver and basically impales Scorn guy from the backside out the front. He still manages to climb on the machine with what little strength he has and activates it with his free hand, at long last giving him the opportunity to remove something that has grown to be more and more of a problem for him since the moment they met. Again, one could consider this the very end of a peculiar boss fight in which Scorn Guy overcomes a parasite, removing it from his body and finally being free of its ever-growing influence. Given the game's first-person perspective, this also gives an opportunity to show the parasite in full, and reveal that indeed it is the scorn person from the prologue of the game. You remove it from your body and watch as it withers around screaming in agony until you stop using the machine and you get to see it kind of wiggle around a little bit more before ultimately breaking free from the grasp of the claw and climbing up to parts unknown. The problem being, there's no delusion or illusion that you wouldn't see the parasite again. It's just a question of when. And given how close this is to the end of the game, too soon. And the visual cue that this is the end of the game is how Scorn Guy walks here. Where very often at the end of the game, when your character gets really injured, his walk will be kind of stumbly, there will be more shakes in the camera. It's something that a lot of video games use in order to display the fact that this is your character on his last legs, so realistically this is the end of the game. In fact, Journey even does that with your character slowing down and then ultimately falling to his knees and collapsing. It's worth pointing out the reason you have to even go this way is because the gate leading back to this room here uh, is just arbitrarily closed, probably so you end up passing through the pre-scripted uh, animation checkpoints that show Scorn Guy kind of like coughing up blood or falling on his knees or something like that. And similar to Journey Guy, this really is kind of the final leg of Scorn Guy's journey, the last lap for Ascension. 
the door leading to something hopefully better than what he saw earlier is just ahead. He climbs up on one of these racks that manages to lock his arms and legs into place and also has a dick sucking mechanism and a robotic surgeon appears from behind him ready to perform its duties. An interesting plot hole is that the reason Scorn Guys flayed is due to the parasite, and yet one of the arms of the robot manages to clip on to Scorn Guys removed skin flap there as if it was removed by the robot, even though by that point the only thing that happened was the robot dug its claws into Scorn Guy. It finishes its job by cutting into Scorn Guy's head, removing his skull cap and exposing his brain to the elements, and then connects a strange piece of brain to the larger neurological web of, I don't know, interconnected minds at top, and then, like Journey Guy, he seemingly dies. But of course, that's not quite the end for Journey. He may have collapsed on the ground, but he has always had someone looking over him. And it's revealed that there's more than one tall, white, and gold robed figure. For some reason, unlike the other Journeymen who might have made this trek, they seem to take pity on our character and not only give him a second chance at the Journey, but take him over the remaining obstacles to the end. Or is it the case that all of the tombstones represent a collapsed journeyman, and they've all had this opportunity to then go to the very end of the game, and yours just went the farthest? In any case, in a rather spectacular display of triumph, our character gets overpowered with his magical scarf, and flies high into the air. In fact, the flying stone creatures also reappear here, acting sort of as obstacles, but not really. By this point, your character's well and truly beyond their control and their ability to stop you. And strangely enough, when you emerge outside of the dark cloudy vortex, those two stone creatures turn into the carpet creature whale variant. Like with the Light Temple, there's no losing condition here. Even if you fall down amongst the clouds below, those supercharge your magic scarf and you're able to fly back up with absolute ease. I mentioned earlier on in the video that one of the uh, design philosophies the developers had was to lock away having blue skies from the entirety of the game, save for this moment here, a visual reward for the player. Keep that in mind, because there's something about Scorn I'd like to discuss that's somewhat similar to that. This whole little segment really does exist to reward the player for making it to the end of the game. For example, the mountains here, basking in the bright sunlight, look absolutely beautiful, in stark contrast to how the mountains looked in the previous area where they were foreboding. They were an obstacle to overcome because they were what stood between you and getting to the top of the really important mountain. Both the sun and moon are clearly visible in this section, unobscured by any clouds. You truly are on the top of the world. There's nothing left to go except through the peak of the mountain. And of course, this area has its own little sand slide section, or more accurately now, snow slide section, just to relive that fun bit of levity earlier on. And it's filled, you know, throughout with free and frolicking carpet creatures, no longer bound to any of the stone mechanisms that oppressed them earlier. They are truly living their best carpeted life. And where so much of the older areas had oceanic imagery, now here's an area that actually has water. 
For the first time in all of Journey, you see actual running water. It's not imitated by lighting. It's not imitating by some strange light fog. It's there and ever-present. I don't recall any of the developers talking about the fact there's water here, just the blue sky, so it does kind of stand out to me as another possible reward for the player, albeit one they unconsciously put in. In some ways, it is exceptionally odd that such spectacle and beauty would be the reward for finishing this game, one that's so simplistic in nature and mechanics that it's literally impossible to lose. Much more challenging games don't even allow you to run a little victory lap like this game. The quintessential difficult game like Dark Souls, for example, once you beat the final boss, there's maybe one or two things you can do, and then the game's over. Then there's a cutscene at the end. In many ways, that's in fact one of the most unique things about the game. You won, you beat all of the actual challenges, simplistic as they may be, now you get to play around in the winner's sandbox, get to play around with some of the fun little creatures you met along the way, you can jump and run and hop and skip over beautiful landscape, you did it. And you can go to the ending cutscene whenever you want. It's a strangely unconventional system to have an area this big in where effectively the game has already ended but you're still able to play in a new place. Unconventional as it may be, I kind of wish more games had something like this. Rather than railroading and rushing to a finishing cutscene, you have an area like this so that's not just the character in-universe who gets a happy end, the player also does by virtue of being able to continue to play in a post-story area. Now, something like this is probably a lot easier for a game like Journey, which is very simplistic and the movement mechanics involve a lot of flying around, but I'm sure a clever game dev could figure out a good way of implementing something like this for other titles. There is a degree of optionality as well. I tend to spend a lot of time looking around and gazing at the sights, while other gamers could just beeline towards the end. What's interesting is that I was working on this video over a course of three days, and this is the first day I even had these thoughts about how the ending here is kind of a reward in of itself. Journey really is one of those games that the more you think about it or play it, the more you uncover. It's not just a beautiful game, it's also a strikingly competent one. Though incredibly simple, it proves itself to be a very effective work of video game entertainment. And by virtue of its length, it's a game that is very easy to come back to. While I would argue that some areas could just be a little bit longer, the game never overstays its welcome, even when it comes to scaling the mountain in the snow area. And having the option to play through as the red-robed journey guy, as if you're starting the game all over again, or in the white and gold-robed journey guy, New Game Plus effectively, really helps allow gamers to choose how they want to play through it again. But in any case, the end is here. Having conquered all trials and obstacles, Journey Guy defiantly walks towards the light in the crevice of the mountain. The thing he saw at the very beginning of the game now lays directly before him. Technically, in this section, you can wiggle around a little bit, and I think you probably could go back, but the way this is presented really does kind of draw the gamer forward and make some think, no, there's only one way to go. Your ability to jump is also taken away, so in many ways, this kind of parallels the moment where you're scaling up the mountain in the snow area. 
And you can see here I'm kind of dancing around a bit to showcase that you can move left and right. But parallels, you know, the lowest point and here we are at the highest point, the very end of the game, our little guy finally made it. Of course, not wanting to reveal too much about what lays on the other side, the character ends up walking into a massive white void. There could be flourishing civilization that learned from its mistakes. This could be an entryway to journey afterlife. Or maybe he just wants to go forward because everything behind him is in a state of ruin and desolation and it's time for him to start over again. We just don't know what's on the other side, but that might not even matter or speculate as we may, because like they say in creative writing classes, it's not the destination that matters, but the journey. One small thing they do for the ending credits that I greatly appreciate and have noticed during my first playthrough journey is as this little spirit flies around, once he reaches a certain point, the color scheme due to the time of day is actually a little bit different than what it was when you actually went through the area while playing the game. For example, this is not the time of day or the color scheme you saw when going through there. It's a small thing, but I think it helps make the world feel a little bit more alive. And I do appreciate the extra effort to even do that, whereas they could have just had it fly through the map as you saw in the game. And the amusing transition here from like night to day to where the menu was when you actually start the game. It's also kind of funny that I actually apparently ran into another player while going through this, but I never saw anyone. In any case, how does Scorn's ending hold up, comparatively? Similar to Journey, your character's vision turns white, but rather than waking up being looked down upon by a group of tall figures, you wake up in the body of one of the shells that you worked so hard in order to bring to life. Given that the surgeon was effectively an automaton, it makes sense that there's no sort of AI in Scorn's universe. Every machine is purely analog or has to be operated by a user, in some cases in the most extreme fashion possible. You operate pretty similar to how you did in a more fleshy body, and speaking of which, you actually do get a pretty good look at him, not just at your character individually, but also at his entire species, because the other scorn people you saw along the way were withered husks. Here's one with most of the meat on his bones. I've said before in a previous analysis of this game that the general overall appearance of our character Scorn Guy here was a strangely closely guarded secret by the developers, so it genuinely was an interesting moment, a fascinating one, to see him mostly in full. Given the callous and cruel nature of Scorn, it's not surprising that your character isn't rescued by a group of deus ex machinas coming down and giving you awesome powers, but instead you're rescuing yourself in what could be arguably an example of second person gameplay. You can hold yourself and watch this machine continuously stab into you for, to be honest, there's been many discussions about why it does that, but not really any truly discernible reasons. Like I mentioned before, this is where the switching mechanic is introduced, and also the very end of the game. Even Journey with its stay out of the creature's circle of vision, or the red light, green light windstorms, do get utilized at least twice throughout the game. One might argue narratively this is parallel to how in the prologue you need to use Mold Man or his arm in order to unlock the big door leading to the room the pro 
uh, the prologue protagonist becomes a parasite in, but I don't think so. I think a lot of the ending here was extremely rushed. And the reason I think that is because if Paulus is part two, it's the only part two stuff we see, and there's no fucking way that, like, earlier on when they were still planning on making it parts, this is all that would have existed for part two. You walk in a straight line, very similar to the very, very end of Journey. In fact, you're unable to move your camera around and look at some of the interesting sculptures and statues. Your pace slows to a crawl, again, not that dissimilar from Journey, and then eventually you just full-on stop. And that lets you know the game's over, it's time for the ending cutscene. To say the ending cutscene is unsatisfying would be a bit of an understatement. I've seen discussion of the game where people absolutely hate the ending of it, and it's no surprise why. It's just kind of there. It's abrupt. Oh hey, it's you again. I remember you from like three minutes ago. How you doing, buddy? The parasite that has been trying to latch onto you and basically take over your body latches onto you and takes over your body, turning you into a gigantic meat pillar. It's just not satisfying, nor interesting. It's not like the ending of Martyrs or The Boy in the Stripes Striped Pajamas where there actually is an important narrative or Aesop with the ending at hand. It's just kind of there. It's not like it's too deep for you, philosophical, existential, it's just kind of there. The fact that I know most of part two was never made makes this ending even worse for me, because I know that if they just stuck with the plan and released part one and then worked on part two, they probably could have had something genuinely amazing to end the game with. And yet, the only thing that we really know they were thinking about when it comes to Part 2 is the notion of seeing actual ascended forms and how they are like and how they interact with the technology at hand. I recall during my first playthrough of Scorn, and my only full playthrough of Scorn, that I was just very ambivalent about this ending. You know, it's just kind of happened, and then when the credits started to roll and the game was over, I ended with, I think, like, well, that's the game. Six years of intellectual dedication to a video game, and it all ends up looking like this. Man, I wish I'd gone to fucking Five Nights at Freddy's instead. At least they're, they're getting, like, a fucking movie and Security Breach is evidently getting a really big DLC. There's books, there's merchandise, I mean I haven't even gotten the fucking physical Kickstarter rewards that I backed the game for all the way back in 2017. <sighs> so, yep, there's the end. That's Scorn, everyone. You remember how earlier in the video I talked about how the sky being blue in Journey was supposed to be something of a reward in of itself? A little treat for the player for making it all the way to the end, and I think Scorn could have done something similar. Well, in the art book, they actually talk about how the ascended forms were supposed to be almost psychedelic in nature. Vivid, vibrant, seemingly breaking the established rules of reality and presenting something never seen before in Scorn. And that could have been the reward, because Scorn is a very desaturated game. There really is not a lot of color to it, and most of the game is like the exact same color scheme over and over and over again. Imagine for a second if they didn't fucking blow it. Imagine for a second if there really was a full-on part two and that led to your character 
becoming one of these ascended forms and traversing some psychedelic landscape. Something similar to the end of Journey. An ascended form finally free from the horrors and trials and pitfalls and desolation behind him. Maybe even the ascended form that looks like it can fly. The ultimate freedom according to some people being able to experience a domain of the sky. It's kind of funny because if they just had Scorn Guy go through the portal, I think the game would have been a little bit better received just because the ending wasn't so abrupt and arbitrary. Like, how long has it been since the parasite became a thing and Scorn Guy came out of the wall? Probably a long, long fucking time, but it's just been kind of camping there in the prologue area for decades, centuries, and then all of a sudden it's able to like crawl around and meander through some complex. There's a lot of reasons why Journey feels like a longer game than Scorn, and the fact that it's a complete game, that everything from start to finish that the developers wanted to implement are there. Scorn, meanwhile, given that two entire areas are missing from the part one section, a lot of the gameplay in Polis is just shit, you know, kind of carried over from the Blasted Labyrinth, and Polis is the only location in all of part two we really did get just like 40% of a game. And who knows what else they had in the previous builds that were ultimately removed from the final product, too. Scorn is objectively longer than Journey. It takes more hours to complete the game, even if you're rushing through or know how to solve all the puzzles without any wasted time. And yet, due to the fact that there's almost no variation in the environments, that there's no high points and low points to help complement each other, that the gameplay remains extremely same-ish due to the limited weapon selection you have for the overwhelming majority of the game, and the fact that the game isn't even complete, and that the ending isn't particularly interesting and memorable, Journey ends up feeling like the longer game. And at the end of the day, that might be far more important than actually being the longer game. I hope you enjoyed the video, that I gave you something to think about and otherwise entertained you. Take care.